So you remember that yesterday we started talking about reduction, and I'm hoping that you were all there because I wasn't planning on redefining things. Um, what we did yesterday included coming up with some definitions, talking about definitions both for networks and what it means, a reduction argument, what is that? And then we spent some time on an example, and I thought what I'd do today is talk a little bit about what kinds of benefits uh, reduction arguments might bring to information theory, and then maybe we'll, we'll talk about some conclusions. So here's a little outline of today's talk. Um, one of the things that reduction can bring to information theory might be some unifying theory, some results that apply not just to a particular example where they're derived, but in fact apply broadly across many kinds of networks, for example. And we talked about one such result yesterday. So yesterday we proved, the, gave the complete proof, in fact, that delay does not affect capacity in memoryless networks. And that argument applied for all memoryless networks, whether you had feedback or no feedback, uh, whether you had noise or no noise, any kind of memoryless network, the, the same argument applies. And today I thought I'd give just another example of this kind of argument. You might ask yourself a question generally about network communications and then try and use a reduction strategy to prove or disprove whatever you believe to be the answer to your question. So one question that I was interested in is how does dependence affect the capacity of a network? By which I mean imagine that you have a very uh, general arbitrary network, but somewhere in that network there are two different channels. I'll call them channel A and channel B. And I want to ask myself the question, does the capacity of my network change if the noise in these two channels is dependent as compared to the case where the noise in these two channels is independent? So these channels may be at arbitrary places in your network. For simplicity, I'll draw them as point-to-point -point channels, but they need not be. And they need not be the whole network. This can be any small piece of a much larger network. And I want to ask the question, if I have noise in these two channels that's dependent, will I get a different capacity than if I have noise that's independent? And in particular, can it both help and hurt, or can it only help or only hurt, or is it always the same? You know, I, I'd like to tease out a little bit what is the impact of dependence on noise. So let's start with definitions. First of all, when I say that I have two channels, I'm imagining now that if you take the channel output for A and look at its conditional distribution given both A and B, that that distribution only actually depends on A. That is, the output of channel A is conditionally independent of the, out of the input of B uh, given the input of A. Which is to say that this channel is somehow a channel from XA to YA, its input is not XB. And likewise, for channel B, if you look at the conditional distribution on the output of channel B, given the inputs of both of these channels, you'd like that for this to be a separate channel, it will require that the conditional distribution on the output of channel B depends only on the, out the input of channel B um, and not the input also of channel A. So that's what I'll mean by two separate channels, is that each one has its own input and its own output. What do I mean by these two channels being independent or dependent? Well, if these two channels are independent of each other, then this conditional distribution should factor into two separate conditional distributions. But if they're dependent on each other, while both of these relationships are required to hold, it won't factor. And I'll give you an example where that, that holds in just a minute. So in the independent case, the conditional distribution on the pair of outputs given the pair of inputs should look just like the product of the distributions associated with A and B, respectively. And in the case where they're dependent, you'd like this relationship not to factor, even though each of the outputs is conditionally independent of the unrelated input or the, the opposing input. Uh, nonetheless, this structure should be factor. So let's give an example where that actually occurs. Imagine that you have two Gaussian channels and we'll look at two cases, an independent case and a dependent case, and this red line will just be my notation to suggest dependence between these two separate channels. So I'm drawing them as separate channels to indicate the first relationship from the previous slide, that is the output of this channel depends only on its input, the output of this channel depends only on its input, let's say this is A and this is B. 
Um, likewise, this output depends only on its input and vice versa, but in this case, they won't factor. And, and when can that occur? Here's an example. Imagine that in both cases, what your two channels look like are just additive noise models. In particular, we'll assume additive Gaussian noise in both cases. So in the first channel, channel A, we have an output which is equal to the input of channel A, this is this x11, plus the noise on channel A, this is z1. And likewise, in the second channel, we have the output y22 here is just a function of the input x12 and the noise in that channel. And that will apply, that relationship will apply in both of these models. In both of these cases, we'll assume that the noise is Gaussian with some variance n. But the two cases will differ from each other in the two random variables, whether they're independent or dependent on each other. So in one case, we'll imagine that z1 and z2 are independent Gaussian random variables. And in the other case, we'll imagine that they're dependent random variables. In both cases, they have the same noise variance, but I'm choosing a particular dependence just to have a simple and extreme case here where in one case z1 is equal to minus z2, in the other case we're doing two separate draws of a Gaussian random variable. So these are my two examples, and if we go back a slide, you'll notice that they satisfy both of these equations. So in both cases, if you take the output and you condition on both the corresponding input and the other input, you'll find that the output depends only on the input of interest. It's conditionally independent of the other one, so yA is conditionally independent of xB. XB doesn't show here, and YB is conditionally independent of XA, XA doesn't show here. That relationship certainly holds in this case. But in one case, in the case where the Gaussians are independent, you'll find that the distribution does factor, and in the other case where the Gaussians are dependent, you'll find that the distribution doesn't factor in this way. Because in this case, if you knew both say the input and the output to channel A, that would certainly change what you thought of the output of YB given XB. And so uh, when you try and factor these, you don't get a factoring equation in that way due to the dependence of those noise random variables. It's not hard to see in this case that the capacity of these two networks is very, very different. So I'm just building networks out of these two simple channels just as a simple case. In one case, I'm uh, putting them in parallel. In the other case, I'm also putting them in parallel. In this case, they're independent of each other. In this case, they're dependent on, on each other. And I don't think it's hard to convince yourself that the capacity of this network, where the noise in the two channels is dependent, is much, much higher. In fact, it's, again, infinite, as we saw in a previous example, than the capacity in this channel. So just to go through that argument, <coughs> In this case, the capacity of this network turns out to be twice the capacity of each individual channel. So it's 1 half log 1 plus p over n, where p is whatever your power constraint is individually on each of these channels, and n is this noise variance that was given to us. In the other case, the capacity of the channel is infinite, and that's not hard to convince yourself of either. Imagine here that we just send the same x over both channels. That seems like a counterintuitive strategy. If you're trying to send more information, why would you send the same information over both channels? But it's not hard to see why that should help you. In this case, we'll get x plus z over the top channel and x minus z over the bottom channel just because of this relationship that the two noises have to each other. And if you add those two things up together, you get x plus z plus x minus z, you get 2x. And 2x means that you're reliably communicating this continuous random variable across a, a network, and thereby getting an infinite amount of rate through that system. So it's a simple example that shows that dependence between the noise in different channels can help you. My intuition was that the, this is a good case. You know, it's a, an extremely good case where things worked out really well. My intuition when I started thinking about this question is there should be bad cases also. In fact, being a believer in Murphy's Law, you might think that, well, you know, things can get really, really bad if you have dependence in the wrong kind of way, some sort of uh, a uh, painful dependence that, that works out to hurt you. And that's the question that we want to ask. So we already have an example that shows that the capacity of the network here, we're having dependent channels. We already have an example that says the capacity of the network with demands can be a superset of the capacity of the network without, I'm sorry, with dependence can be a superset 
of the capacity of the network without dependence. We'd like to understand, can it also go the other way around? Is it ever true, no matter you know, how you put together this network, no matter where those channels happen to exist, is it ever true that the dependence that you end up with can give you this opposite relationship, that you'd actually do better with independent noise than you do with dependence? The dependence somehow is set up to hurt you. Um, and it turns out that the answer to that question by a very simple reduction argument is no, that there doesn't exist any network where you have a pair of channels somewhere inside your network where those, the noise in those two channels is dependent. I'm again assuming that my network is memoryless using all the definitions from last time. Um, the networks, the two networks that you want to compare differ only in the dependence between those two channels. Those two channels can be anywhere. The demands that you might be trying to send through your network can be anything. And the answer is no, it's never true that the capacity of the network with dependence is actually smaller than the capacity region of the network with independence. Or in other words, the capacity of the network with independence channels is always a subset or equal to the capacity of the network with dependent channels, meaning the dependence of noise can only help. Sometimes it may not help, sometimes it may help a lot, as we just saw, but it can never hurt. Now, how do we prove this result? We certainly don't prove it by trying all possible networks with all possible de uh, dependence relationships and channels in all possible positions with all possible demands. That would be too much to ask. But we can demonstrate this relationship very easily using the kind of reduction argument that we introduced last time. And that's the argument that I'll show you. It's, again, um, so simple as to be almost embarrassingly short, um, but here it is. So imagine that you have a code for the network with the independent channels. So imagine that somehow you've designed a code for this pair of channels, and I've drawn that code for you here. Again, I'm drawing this network as if it only has two nodes, not because it does, but because the picture is smaller and I can fit it in on the slide. Imagine that it has a million nodes, and you could picture this same table for the million node network just as easily. Um, as for this simple two-node network. And somewhere inside this network, we have a pair of channels, and we're trying to communicate reliably over this network an arbitrary collection of demands. So this is our code. It has some particular rate and some particular error probability. And I just want to show that I can use this code to design another code for the network with dependent channels, such that if the error prob if you had a sequence of codes with a particular rate and error probability on this network, um, you can design a sequence of codes here such that if this error probability is going to zero, this one is going to zero as well, and the rates are asymptotically the same. So can you want to say something of the modeling and thing? Because I'm having some trouble reconciling something in my head. So suppose take the additive Gaussian noise example in the beginning. Suppose y1 is equal to x plus z1, and y2 is equal to x plus z2, same x, because you want to have the two inputs x1 equal x2. Then if z1 equals z2, you assume you have only one output. But if z1 is independent of z2, you have independent outputs that you can do better. So what is something is not capturing the sum? So if you are putting the same inputs into those two channels, then you have chosen a coding strategy, and your coding strategy may not be correct. It, it, it goes and you have it somewhere inside the network. I see. So you're using a broadcast channel in that case, right? Yeah, you're forcing the yes. same x to yes. go across both. And and here in the example that we're using, we're using uh, two you're using a product, separate you're using channels. A product, product channels. So, so right. So channels. your okay. definition won't meet my first definition of okay. two separate channels. That's one separate channel inputs. with dependent noise. So separate inputs. To separate. You want separate inputs. So yes, if you're constraining your code, you've effectively forced it to be a single channel. Right, if you if you're forcing the same input in both, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. <coughs> in that case, I got infinite. You wouldn't necessarily. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily be able to take advantage of it. Maybe you have dependent channels at parts of the network that just don't have an opportunity to work together in the way that we did across these these dependent channels. So it wouldn't always be as good. But we've, what we've shown is that it can never hurt. That that dependence can never work against you. It may really work for you. It may work for you a little bit in some examples. I mean, this is an artificial case. But it can never hurt. There's never a place that you can put dependence that secretly really messes things up for you. All right, so how's our argument going to work? It's going to work in much the same way as the delay argument that we used last time, which is that we're going to use a code of block length n 
to design a code for the network with dependent channels at block length 2n. So we had previously a code of block length n that was designed for the network with uh, independent channels. And now I'm taking that code and using it to design a, a block length 2n code for the network with dependent channels. And what am I going to do? I'm simply going to take my message and break it up into two pieces. Again, I'm calling the first piece of message one, I'm putting parentheses one after it, and the second piece of message one, I'm putting uh, a two after it. And then I'm simply going to transmit in odd and even time steps across this pair of channels. So I'm, I'm breaking the dependence, basically. I'm getting independent looks, because remember that my channel was memoryless. <coughs> And I'm simply taking the parts of my code that rely on the first half of the message uh, and using them in the odd time steps, and the second half on the even time steps on one of the two channels. On the other channel, I'm doing the opposite. I'm taking the first half of my message and using it in the even time steps, and the second half of my message and using it in the odd time steps across these two channels. By breaking my message up and sending parts across the odd time steps and the other parts across the even time steps, I'm essentially sending the two parts of the same message across independent looks at the corresponding channels. The channels need not be the same as each other, but I get independent looks every new time step because of the fact that by assumption my channels are memoryless. So I'm breaking the dependence between my channels by simply breaking my code up in time and using independent instances of the two different channels that I have available to me. In that way, I can design a code that has the same error probability. I'm sending twice as many uh, bits because my block length has doubled, and I'm using the uh, channel twice as many times, so I get exactly the same rate that I had before. Since I'm using the code twice, I get twice the error probability by the union down. That is, the probability of error is at, in the worst case equal to the sum of the probability of error of the two uses of those two different codes. And so I get an error probability of two times the error probability of the old code. So if we had a sequence of codes that achieved this particular rate, R1 and R2, with a probability of error going to zero in the original network, the network with no dependence, that same sequence of codes can be used to design block length 2 n codes uh, with the same rate and twice the error probability. If the error probability was going to zero over here, twice the error probability is going to zero over here. And I show the achievability of the same rate point R1 on 2 which tells us that the capacity, any points that you could achieve on the original network with independent channels, is a subset or equal to the capacity for the dependent channels. That is, the same rate can be achieved on the network with dependent channels. Because you can break that dependence by simply playing this game in time in order to ensure that you get independent looks at the two channels that are available. Question. There's a side information uh, inequality that says that given the side information, your entropy only decreases. At least, in, I, I'm not that familiar with it, but at least in my head, it would seem that if you were to write these things out in terms of entropies, you would end up in, in that case. I, I'm not sure. It's possible. It's possible that there's another proof to the same result, but it's not so clear to me because here, these channels can be anywhere in some very complicated uh, Because I remember that when I learned that inequality, I, I also got very surprised because the idea is precisely that any information given, independent of what it is, in the long term will help. That's what it says. So, the conditional entropy that you're looking at may not have a physical instantiation in this network that allows you to take advantage of that property. So I'm not sure whether you could prove it that way or not, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah? Other questions? I thought I saw one somewhere. Here. Um, it is It is interleaving the use of the two different channels. So it, in two time steps, I get two uses of the first channel and two uses of the second channel. And when they're dependent, my code may fail. But if I take the two uses and I flip one but not the other, so that for one of my uh, channels, I'm using the opposite time step, so that the same code is using the odd time steps on one and the even time steps on the other, in that sense, so yes, I'm using two codes, but they're not quite cleanly interleaved. They're interleaved opposite odds and evens on the two channels to, to break that dependence, to ensure that any single code is actually seeing independent uses 
of the two channels in operation, no matter where they're in operation. Does that make sense? Suppose the dependence is like that one of the nodes is that some of the, all the past of the other, for example. I'm trying to form a, something that... All the past of the other? Is that yes, what you said? Yes. Okay, so once you add memory, uh, this result doesn't apply, right? Because now... I was the, hoping that the channels would be memoryless by themselves, but the, the dependence is no. Um, I, I think not. I think that the result will break in that case. I, and again, the point here is that you have to show that the code would have performed just the same as it performed in the independent case. So now if it's, the noise is somehow depending upon some deep, deep past, I mean, if it had some finite memory, maybe you could play this game. But if it can de depend arbitrarily far in the past, then you're going to have dependence no matter how far, you know, how many of these codes you interleave or, or intermix in this way. And, and then you can't show, and it's <coughs> not clear to me, that the same error probability Result. But here we get exactly the same error probability in the case with dependent channels because we're effectively using independent channels to send each particular code. So the first use of, code, of the code is in white and it's being sent on half evens and half odds depending upon which of the channels you're going over. And the second use is in reds, it's just flipping those roles in order to guarantee that any code sees independent instances of this particular channel. Yeah. Okay. So again, this is a simple way of showing a particular relationship that applies for any kind of network with any kind of demands. Notice that again, I haven't solved any capacity. I haven't told you what the capacity of this network is. I haven't shown you how much it might increase in the cases where it does increase. But I have shown you a very general kind of result that applies across many, many kinds of networks. And I've managed to do that without finding the capacities of all of them, which is a much, much harder problem. Again, this is the power of reduction. I'd like to suggest that this is a way of thinking about a more unifying theory. That is, we can start to understand general questions, the answers to general questions, without having to study every possible example in which that question can arise. And yet, we manage to get the answer to all of the questions, all of the networks in which this property might be observed. So that's what I meant by unifying theory. You can imagine many other kinds of questions that you could ask that would apply to all kinds of network systems and try to construct for yourself scenarios where you can play this game, where you can show a relationship between two possible answers um, and show whether it applies or doesn't apply in general for networks. Now a second benefit I think that reduction can bring to network information theory is to bring up what I'll call canonical examples. And what I mean by a canonical example is any example whose solution would solve many, many other problems, I'll call that a canonical example. So if I can tell you a question such that if you can answer that question, it will also give the answer to hundreds of other questions, I'd suggest that's a very powerful question to ask or a very powerful question to try and answer because if you get it, you get for free all these other possibilities. And I, I'd like to suggest that, that this reduction strategy can highlight such examples, and, and here's an example. So let's ask ourselves the question, how do network demands impact the capacity? Now remember that last time I drew a picture, it didn't look quite like this. This network looks like it has a directionality to it just to make my picture simple. Um, our networks don't necessarily have a directionality. There aren't necessarily nodes that are only input nodes or only output nodes, but to keep my picture simple, I imagine here that I have nodes one and two sending information, and that each of those has perhaps more than one, one or more than one, uh, nodes wishing to receive that information. So this is a particular demand structure that we call a multiple multicast demand. And in order to understand what a multiple multicast system is, let me take a step back and, and give you a few definitions. So if you have a source, such as this source uh, W1, that's required by, I'm sorry, such as the source message W2, that's required by one or more receivers, we call that a multicast demand. It's just terminology. I don't know who came up with this name, um, but that's what it's called. So if you have a message that's desired by more than one receiver, we call that a multicast demand. In contrast, if you have a message that's desired only by a single receiver, you'll notice that message W1 is here desired only by receiver 1, which is what I'm trying to designate by this output link with a W1, uh, we call that a unicast demand. So unicast is desired by one and only one receiver, multicast is desired by one or more receiver. 
You'll notice that by this definition, because it has one or more, unicast is considered a special case of multicast. Again, just terminology, I didn't make it up. I don't love it, but that's the terminology that we have. Okay, likewise, if you have a network in which there are multiple multicasts, in fact, one or more multicast demands, we'll call that a multiple multicast network. And if you have a network with multiple demands, but uh, none of them are multicast, I'm sorry, none of them are, have more than one receiver, this terminology doesn't quite work here, but more, none of them have more than one receiver, we'll call that a multiple unicast demand. So if you have a network in which every message is desired by one and only one receiver, we'll call it multiple unicast. If you have a network where at least one of the messages is desired by more than one receiver, we'll call it multiple multicast. And we'd like to ask the question, so because of the fact that multiple unicast is viewed as a special case of multiple multicast, you'll remember that unicast was viewed as a special case of multicast, so multiple unicast is viewed as a special case of multiple multicast. Because of the way these definitions work, if you could solve all multiple multicast networks, by definition, you would have solved all multiple unicast as well. It's just considered a special case. But you can ask yourself the question, is the opposite also true? If you could solve all multiple unicast networks, which seems to be simpler, you now only have to worry about getting each message to a single receiver, would that also give you the solution to all multiple multicast networks as well? Can we focus on this special case? In fact, if you look inside the Coker and Thomas book, which many of you are probably familiar with, an introductory book in information theory, they only look at this case where every message is desired by a single receiver. And you can ask yourself the question, is that restrictive? If we could solve all those problems, would that be everything? Or would we then have to go back and solve the multiple multicast problems as well? Would there be something left to be done? Now, if you're thinking about this question, there's evidence to suggest that maybe figuring out multiple unicast is enough. Because there's a paper from 2006 that doesn't ask about capacity, which is what I want to focus on today. It asks about code design. But it shows, at least for the network coding problem, and specifically for code design rather than capacity, that in fact it's a for every possible multiple multicast problem there exists a multiple unicast problem such that if you could design a code for this network it will also give you a code for the original network that is if you can design a code for the multiple unicast network that will tell you how to design a code for the multiple multicast network as well another way of saying this is that it's enough to learn how to design codes for multiple unicast networks at least in the network coding realm that will teach you everything there is to know about how to design codes for the multiple multicast networks as well. It'll at least tell you how to design good codes, maybe not the only good codes, but some sort of good codes. So let's see how their argument works. The argument takes the original network, and again, they looked only at the network coding case, and they add to that original network a collection of what I'll call broken butterflies. Each broken butterfly is added in a location that connects two receivers that were interested in the same demand. So here we have two receivers interested in X1. I'll add a broken butterfly in the connecting the two receivers that were interested in X1. And before I tell you too much about this example, let me remind you about the butterfly example. I'm sure you've seen it. It probably must have been on day one of this um, class, or the sequence of classes, but let me just remind you how it works. So there's a, a beautiful example in the original network coding paper by Asfede et al. It didn't look quite like this one, but this was sort of the heart of the matter of what their example looked like. And it, it's a simple network. It's a network of lossless edges, so every time I transmit information down a particular edge, it's guaranteed to be delivered perfectly. There's no noise, no erasures, and no errors of any kind. And we'll imagine in this network that each of these links at each time step can carry one bit. So we can transmit one bit per time step down this link, and one bit per time step down this link, and one bit per time step down this link, and so on for every link in this network. And we start out with information at two nodes. Uh, the node up here on the left has source x1. The node up here on the right has source x3. I only called it x3 because uh, in a later picture, it'll be X3. It was X3 in the earlier picture as well, so I'll call it X3. X3 is desired by this node as well. And we'd like to understand at what rates can these two messages be reliably transmitted through this system. So we want to simultaneously send information along this route and along this route, along these 
uh, capacity one links, and we want to understand how much information can be sent. So if you only had to worry about sending X1 and just didn't bother sending X3 at all, it's easy to see how you would transmit the information. There's a nice path here that you can transmit the information, and you could send certainly one bit uh, per channel use on average across this channel. That's not hard to see. Of course, at the same time, you're getting rate zero for the other message. Likewise, if we were only worrying about X3, we could get a rate one from its desired transmitter to its desired receiver. We could get this rate one, but of course here we're getting rate zero across the other. And so in total we have a graph that looks something like this. We know that the rate one zero and zero one can be achieved in this network, but we'd like to do better. And what the paper by Asfede, Kai, Lee, and Young showed in 2001, this is really the paper with which the field of network coding was born, is that in fact the point one one is achievable. You can simultaneously get one bit per transmission for message one and one bit per transmission for message three through this network, despite the fact that they both have to go through this bottleneck link whose capacity is only one. And the way that they did that, which is an old story by now, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, is the following. They noticed that the only thing that this node can transmit is this message X1, so he might as well transmit it across both links. That's all he knows about the world is X1, and he can transmit everything he knows, so he'll do that. Likewise, this node will transmit X3 on both links. And here you have your bottleneck. This guy would like X1 to be the message transmitted here. This guy would like X3 to be the message transmitted here. What they noticed was that if we send the binary sum of x1 plus x3, that's still a single bit, so it'll fit on this link of capacity 1. And that's actually enough to allow both receivers to decode what it is they want to learn. In particular, this receiver here receives x1, and he didn't want x1, but it's useful to him if he gets x1 plus x3, and additionally gets x1, he can certainly decode from that x3. And likewise, if you get x1 plus x3 and you get message x3, you can certainly decode from that the message x1. The example demonstrates that it's useful sometimes to do coding inside your network, not only at the edges. So there's no way we could have prepared ourselves at the edges of this network for this bottleneck link. But since this node gets all the information that he needs, he can combine that information in a way that allows everybody to decode. It's it moves away from what was traditionally a traffic model of information. You thought of information as cars somehow zooming along your network and gets to a coding operation. You can mix these two things together in a way that I hope you never mix your car with somebody else's in order to get both of them through as efficiently as uh, getting each one through separately. And that allows us to show that the capacity region of this network is actually a square rather than this diagonal that you could get when you only allowed yourself to do rounding instead of adding coding. So this is just showing the two decoding operations that allow you to reconstruct the messages that each receiver is interested in. What Doherty and Zieger did was they took that same butterfly structure, and any time there were two receivers who wanted the same message, notice these guys both want x1, they added that butterfly, but they broke its wing. So that one way that X1 used to travel through this network would have to come from one of those receivers, and the other way that X1 used to travel through this network would have to go from the other receivers. And they demonstrated that the only way that this code can be successful, notice that now message X1 is desired over here, and we've added a third source, a source that wasn't available in this network, and a third demand, a demand to this node for the source X3. The only way that they could successfully decode at the end of this system is if both of these guys actually got X1, and we used exactly the code that we uh, looked at in the butterfly example. So they're effectively taking this butterfly example, they're thinking about the code that you would use on this butterfly example, they're then moving this link across so that now x1 has to come from this other source instead, and through a proof that I won't show, they're demonstrating that a particular rate is achievable on this network if and only if the corresponding rate is achievable on this network as well, and vice versa. So they show that a point R1, R2 is in this capacity region, if and only if the point R1, R2, and this source here, right here, is desired also at the rate R1, is available on this network. And you can play that game no matter how many receivers wanted this particular message X1. You just keep on adding butterflies and keep on adding extra sources. And you get this one-to-one -one relationship between rates that you can achieve on one code and rates that you can achieve on the other. 
Now, let me point out a few important things about this example. One is that the particular value or the particular broken butterfly that we add to this network has edge capacities that depend on which rate R1 and R2 we were trying to prove to be achievable or design a code for in this network. And that will be important later. So when we designed a multiple unicast network, it actually depended on the rate vector, in this case only R1, because only message 1 was desired by more than one receiver. But in general, it would depend on the whole rate vector. Um, which structure you end up with would depend on the rate vector that you were trying to achieve in this particular multiple multicast network. For every different rate vector, you'd need to design a different network. All right. So since multiple unicast networks are a special case of multiple multicast networks, this actually proves that co-design for these two problems are equivalent. That is, if you can learn how to do multiple unicast network coding, that will tell you everything about how to design codes for multiple multicast network codes. And likewise, this side is trivial, but likewise, if you can learn to design codes for multiple multicast network codes, that will tell you how to design codes for multiple unicast uh, codes. Notice that this is good news and it's bad news. It depends on your perspective. So, the good news is that it suffices to learn how to design codes for multiple unicast networks. If you can learn that, that'll be enough to learn how to design codes for multiple multicast networks. That's the good news. The bad news, though, is that that effectively means that multiple unicast coding is no easier than multiple multicast coding. That is, if you can get the designs for one from the designs for the other, they must be, in some sense, equally hard because this Getting one, turning one code design into the other is a trivial process in this particular construction. So on the one hand, you might as well focus on this example. It's going to solve everything for you if you can solve that case. On the other hand, don't expect that case to be easy. In fact, it's equally hard to the other because it solves all those problems as well. All right, so now let me get back to the original question. The uh, Doherty and Ziegler result tells us about code design. But what we'd like to understand is capacity. And while the prior result looks promising, um, it doesn't tell us everything that we need to know. It has a few challenges that remain for us. And let's just show what those challenges are. For one thing, um, it turns out that the Doherty and Zeger paper was proven with error probability zero rather than error probability approaching zero, which is what we would need for the capacity. And their argument, at least as far as we can tell, it's not obvious how to take their argument and turn it into the asymptotic error probability case. It really seems to be quite delicate in that precise zero error probability um, assumption that they made. The second is that they assume that it was network coding, and we'd like a property to hold for all memoryless networks. We hope not to restrict ourselves to the network coding world. Um, in when you go to the memoryless networks, of course, this assumption of error probability exactly zero doesn't make sense for most networks. In most networks, asymptotically zero error probability is very different than true zero error probability. So we'd like to focus on the Shannon definition of capacity uh, with the asymptotic definition. And for memoryless networks, that, that makes a, a very big difference. Um, and another point is that the network that they design varies with the desired rate, as I pointed out to you previously. And that'll make this relationship challenging. And finally, it requires that you get the rate exactly rather than asymptotically. And again, that ties into the fact that we're using a different uh, network every time when we're considering the code design for a particular rate vector. We end up with a network that relies on that rate vector. That's going to be problematic because in capacity, you remember we have a closure in the definition of capacity. And somehow now you're going to have to look at an infinite collection of different networks and to do that closure seems to be complicated. So um, the solution provides a, a variety of challenges. But it turns out that using a solution that's inspired by and similar to but has a quite a different argument than the Doherty and Seeger relationship, we've been able to show that multiple multicast networks capacities can be solved by solving the capacities for memoryless uh, for multiple unicast networks in all memoryless networks. So if you give me any memoryless network, something seems to have gone wrong with my picture here, I apologize. But if you give me any memoryless network, I can design with multiple multicast demands. I can design another memoryless network with only multiple unicast demands, such that we can prove the achievability of any point in this capacity region by asking a corresponding 
question about the capacity region of this other network. In other words, the result tells us that it's sufficient to learn how to do multiple unicast capacity calculation in order to understand how to do multiple multicast capacity. Um, and this network, while it looks complicated, is very much like the other network. You'll notice that what we've done here is every time we have a message that's desired by more than one receiver, we break that message up. Actually, this one was only desired by one, and I broke it up. Oh, no, here's the other one who desired that message. We break that message up into multiple messages, each of which is desired only by a single receiver. And then we set up something like a butterfly network for each of those um, pairs of messages that used to be a single message, we'll set up something like a butterfly. Here's something like a triple butterfly that likewise has a bottleneck and feeds to each receiver every message except for the message that he's interested in reconstructing. And we're able to use a reduction argument to show that for every point in this capacity region, we can prove and we can prove every point in this capacity region or the whole region by deriving the capacity region of this network. I won't go through that argument in detail, but it's another simple reduction argument that again shows that you can use code design for one to do code design for the other and derive a relationship between them. So this tells us that the capacity solution for memoryless multiple multicast networks and memoryless multiple unicast networks are actually equivalent problems, which again says that you don't have to solve all problems anymore. Now you can focus on a special case, the special case of multiple unicast networks instead of, instead of looking at all the multiple multicast networks. It's enough to solve that case. So you might as well specialize. You might as well look at that case. And if you can solve that case, that'll get you everything. Now that's a simple example, but there are many other examples that we've been able to derive and, and have been derived by many researchers in the field. And they fall into multiple categories. I'll show you two categories here. One is the category I'll call code equivalence, which shows that code design for one problem is equivalent to code design for another problem. So multiple multicast network coding code design is equivalent to multiple unicast network coding code design by the Doherty and Zeger paper that we already talked about. And likewise, for many other problems, we have similar relationships. If you're interested in trying to decode, by the way, this slide is hard to read, the definitions are all here. I won't go through all these examples. It's just to point out that there are many kinds of equivalences that we've already been able to demonstrate. And there's quite a bit of power in sequentially deriving these kinds of relationships. Sorry, there's a question. Please. One question. So, uh, but because the network is larger, you know, to show equivalent than Our network did grow, yes. In our construction, the network grew, and it grew by something like the total number of demands rather than the total number of messages. So before it was somehow a function of the number of messages, now we're going to add to that a function also of how many times each of those receivers was demanded. Okay, so if I had also a restriction on the number of uh, branches in the network, then So this network doesn't necessarily even have anything that corresponds to a branch. Right? This network can be arbitrary. It's an arbitrary memoryless network. It's no longer a network coding network. But yes, it's possible that if you say, well, I only want to look at networks of a certain size, then you can ask that question. And actually, people have started asking questions like that. So for example, in a paper by Kamath, Say and Wong in 2014, I think it was at ISIT, they showed a very nice result about code design that shows that if you can figure out how to design codes for two unicast networks, that's sufficient, actually these were network coding networks, that's sufficient to figure out code design for K unicast network coding networks as well. This doesn't restrict the size of the whole network, but it does restrict the number of demands going through that network. Their network also grew in this process, but it's starting to get at the kinds of restrictions that you might be interested in. Trying to get not only to a smaller subclass, but in fact smaller sized examples within that subclass, and that's one step. And we've been able to show a kind of capacity equivalence related to that, which was just submitted to ISIT 2015. So maybe you'll be able to hear about that soon. But, but there is was for a cool design. Other questions? So as I said, there are many examples. I won't go through all of them. I just sort of threw them up here to suggest that there are a lot of them. And there are many more. This list is not uh, complete. But at least it gives you a flavor. And the point of this, um, of putting it up is to also point out that there's a lot of uh, complex relationships that we can uncover 
by demonstrating these very simple pairwise relationships. And I, I wanted to talk you through that a lot, a little bit, because it's something that they use quite a bit in complexity theory. We're just starting to think about it and use it here, uh, but maybe you'll be the ones to make progress on that. So to give you an idea of what I mean by the complex relationships that you can derive, even though reduction is only deriving individually these simple pairwise relationships, uh, let's consider an example. So imagine that you have problems A, B, and C, and some larger family of problems S. So here are a variety of games that you can play using reduction. So for example, you might want to show that A reduces to B. And if you can show that A reduces to B, and you can separately show that B reduces to C, you will get for free that A reduces to C. And this is a game that people play a lot in trying to understand, for example, NP problems in complexity. They don't relate every possible problem to each other. They add to an existing chain of prior results and suddenly show that, ah, since I'm related to this problem for which we know a lot of prior relationships, I'm related to all those problems as well. I get that relationship for free. We can play that game in information theory as well. Likewise, if you show that if A reduces to B and B reduces up, oh, sorry, to A, I think it got covered by this picture, then they say that A and B are equivalent, which we've already given some examples of. Um, another definition, if every problem in some class S reduces to problem A, then we say that A is S hard, and we've started to derive what we can call capacity hard problems, and uh, I'll show you an example of one shortly. If every problem in S reduces to A and A is itself in S, then we say that A is complete. So in that case, you have an example of a problem that's inside the class that you're interested in, and its solution would solve everything in that class. We call that a complete problem. I'd like to suggest that this is a useful structure for thinking about information theoretic problems as well. That is, we should start to understand and derive complete problems, hard problems, problems whose solution would either solve lots of other problems within their same class or problems outside of their same class. Um, in some sense, the multiple unicast problem is a complete problem for the set of multiple, oops, I'm pressing the wrong button here. The multiple unicast problem is complete for the set of multiple multicast network coding problems in code design, for example. We can start to drive more of these and understand where our attention would best be spent which are the problems whose solutions would really make a difference for many other problems, and which are the problems whose solutions are, are limited to insight on, on their own problems. And by the way, those problems are, are useful and interesting also. In some sense, those are the easy problems, and going in and being the ones to solve those um, <coughs> might be an easier problem to solve. All right, so um, let me give you an example of a problem that I would suggest is capacity hard in some sense, and I'll tell you a little bit about which sense in a minute. But first, let me just define the problem for you. This is a problem that um, came up a few years ago, 2011, we started thinking about this question. And I have to say that when we started thinking about this question, I really thought it was going to be a one-week exercise. And a week later, my postdoc would come back and we would continue the conversation about something else. I really thought it was going to be something very easy. And it turned out to be su something surprisingly deep um, and difficult, but also extremely interesting, related to many different problems. And here's how the question goes, at least one form of it. We have several different forms of it that we've come up with over the years, but I'll give it in its simplest form. So imagine that you have two networks. This is my original network, N. And this is some other network. I'm calling it N delta because it differs from the original network only by the removal of a single edge whose capacity happens to be delta. I like to think of delta as a small number. Sometimes I think of it as asymptotically small, sometimes just some fixed number. Just think of it as some fixed capacity. It's, it's a wire in your lab, you know? It's some connection somewhere in the larger internet. And now you ask yourself the question, how much can the capacity of my net network change if I rip out that wire? So imagine you go into your lab tomorrow, you pick a wire at random and you rip it out. How much did the capacity of the internet as a whole change when you ripped out that wire? One wire, right? You'd like to think it didn't have much impact on the capacity of the network as a whole. Our original guess was that the relationship would look something like this. If you tell me that before there was some rate R1 through RK, that could be achieved when nodes 1 through k transmitted through this network, then it should be true now that r1 minus delta through rk minus delta should be achievable on this new network. I mean, in the worst case, every possible message was using this edge to its full capacity delta, 
When I rip it out, it shouldn't hurt anybody by more than Delta. And that's what this original guest had to say. We thought, okay, it must be true. I mean, if anything, this is, looks pessimistic. It must be true that if R1 through RK is in this <laughs> capacity region, that now R1 minus delta through RK minus delta should also be in the capacity region of this network. It's only one wire in your lab. I mean, how much can it help hurt the rest of the universe to rip out that one possibility? Turns out, it's a surprisingly difficult problem, at least surprisingly difficult for me. Maybe you'll go home and solve it tonight. Um, but let me tell you what we know about it so far, and this is just sort of a subset of the results on this, um, on this problem. But some cases are solved, and in every case that we've solved, we've been able to show that this property in fact holds. So in every special case that we've solved exactly, we can show that this impact is at most delta. Um, and we have a variety of examples. Some of them are pretty much trivial, you know, cut set bounds. If your cut set bounds were tight, and they're still tight afterwards. We have to assume that they'll be tight both before and afterwards, and certainly no message was hurt by more than delta. If your sources were co-located and so on, if linear codes were optimal, then that's good enough and so on. There are many cases where we can say something, but we certainly can't say something everywhere. We have tried very hard to come up with a counterexample, and we've failed at constructing a counterexample. Maybe that's what we have to do tonight construct that counterexample, I don't know. That would also be interesting. Please let me know if you do. I would love to hear about it. But in addition to this variety of results, oh, we've also been able to show that for all the outer bounds that we know of out there, the ways that people put outer bounds on capacity regions, we don't know if those bounds are tight, but those bounds satisfy this property. That is, the bounds themselves change by at most delta in every dimension when you remove a single edge, so that's interesting. Linear programming, actually, we get another constant in there, so it doesn't change by exactly delta, but some constant times delta. That's good enough for most of our purposes. But the, the most interesting point, the one that I, I bring up this example to illustrate, is that we've also been able to show that this question is related to many other questions. In fact, if you can solve this question, you'll get the solutions to all these other questions for free. And I, I won't tell you about all of them, but let me give you an example. So in network coding, there are two subsets of the literature. It's actually a little bit messy. There, there are some problems, I think, in the literature because of this. So half the people in network coding solve network coding problems assuming that the error probability can be precisely zero. So they define capacity to mean reliable communication under the definition of reliability that says you're only reliable if your error probability is exactly zero. And I think intuitively, they're motivated by the fact that there's no noise anywhere in the network coding network. So I think intuitively, they feel like, well, you, if you can do reliably, you should be able to do truly reliably, zero error. Um, on the other hand, the other half of the literature, and don't take half literally, but you know, the other portion of the literature, defines capacity in the network coding realm in the same way that Shannon defined capacity. Reliability means probability of error going to zero. And so some of the results are derived from one definition, and some of the results are derived from the other. And unfortunately, they use each other's results as if they're true everywhere. And you know, maybe some of them are, and some of them aren't. Or maybe they all are, I don't know. But to date, it has not been proven whether these two capacity regions that you end up with are always the same. In special cases, they're the same of each other. If you have a single multicast demand, you can show that anything you can get reliably in the Shannon sense, you can also get with probability of error exactly equal to zero. But in general, we don't know. We don't know the answer of whether probability of error going to zero changes the capacity region of some network coding instance, or whether the capacity regions are always the same. It turns out that the capacity regions are the same if and only if this property that we thought would be easy to prove about edge removal is true. So we can demonstrate an if and only if relationship between these two problems that you know, maybe you can find some intuition that relates them. Certainly there is intuition, otherwise we wouldn't have been able to make a construction. But on the surface, they look like very different problems. But we can demonstrate that one result is true if and only if the other result is true. That is, the two capacity regions are the same, the one that you get with zero error, uh, definition of reliability and probability of error going to zero, definition of reliability. Those two capacity regions are identical to each other for all networks, if and only if removing a, an edge of capacity delta anywhere in any network under any demand <coughs> can never hurt any demand by more than delta in every dimension. And this is another example that I would call a canonical, or in this case, a hard problem. 
Hard, by the definition, you might think of it as difficult. Maybe it means that too, but that's not what I mean here. I mean that it is outside of the class of problems that we're interested in, probably. I mean, it, it doesn't look like the same class of these. And yet, solution to that question would give you solution to many other questions. And I gave you one example. There are a few more examples here. There are actually quite a few more. Every time I run into a problem that I can't solve, nowadays I try and see if it's the same as the edge removal problem. Because that one, you know, we've gotten stuck on before. Many of these other things that we get stuck on turn out to be the same as this seemingly simple but actually quite uh, deep question. All right, so that's what I mean by canonical examples. I would argue that it would be useful to understand more about which examples in information theory are canonical. Which ones would have solutions that would give you lots of other answers for free? Every time you prove a theorem, you might as well get all the other theorems that come with it for free by understanding the relationship between your question and all those other questions. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that um, reduction gives you a way of thinking of questions that I, for one, would never have thought of otherwise. But I think that they're interesting questions and useful questions and deep questions that can help us to understand our field better. And so I'll give you a few examples. So I've been talking so far about two kinds of reduction. We talked about the Nordy Zeger example, which showed how to design one code from another. We showed, talked about several examples where we learned to solve one capacity region from solving another. But so far, we don't actually understand the relationship between these two kinds of reduction. So if I tell you the two problems are equivalent from a capacity perspective, that is, learning to solve the capacity of one would tell you about the capacity of the other, give you a solution to the capacity of the other, does that always mean that the same is true for code design? I mean, so far, we usually prove these capacity equivalence relationships through code design, but it, that's not necessarily the only way. Likewise, if you know that code design on one problem will solve code design on another problem, that these two problems are equivalent, does that tell you that they're capacity equivalent as well? So far, we don't have examples that you know, demonstrate that it's not true, but we also don't know that it's true in general, that learning how to solve one kind of problem, um, say network coding multiple unicast problems from a code design perspective, doesn't always tell you or it's not clear if it always tells you how to do capacity for the same, the corresponding problem. So it, it raises these new questions. We never would have thought to ask these questions before, or these notions didn't exist before, but I would argue that the questions are interesting. Likewise, um, we know, and I didn't go through this, that multiple unicast index coding is in some sense code design complete for network coding, that you can solve the whole family of network coding problems by solving problems in which there's actually only one internal node in your network that can do any coding, which is this node here before a bottleneck. This is a, a family of network codes, a special family of code, network codes that has that property, that there's only one link on which there's really any opportunity to do coding in the middle of your network. And it turns out that if you could solve capacities on all index coding instances, I'm sorry, not capacities, code design on all index coding instances, that would also tell you about um, solving code design for all network coding instances that don't happen to have this structure. But you can ask questions like, well, are there other complete problems? Is this the only one? Is this one somehow special? Or are there other ones that also have that property? Um, for what other large classes of networks can we find complete instances and so on? So it, it starts you thinking in new ways when you start playing around with these reductive strategies. Um, the last thing I thought I'd tell you about is computational tools. And this is a dream I have that, and that I hope that somebody will join me in, which is that I, I think I mentioned last time, I'm a little embarrassed by certain comparisons that you can make with our, between our field and other fields. So you look at people who do circuit design, and they regularly, routinely design circuits with millions of individual components. They have ways of analyzing these things, using that analysis before they build it, to do the design and predict how a chip with millions of individual components is going to behave. Their tools aren't perfect, but they can do it pretty well. I mean, they're willing to invest millions of dollars each time they make a new chip. That those millions of dollars are gambling on the, the fact that their analysis was correct. We should be able to do the same thing in information theory for very large networks. 
I mean, you give me a network with a million components, broadcast channels, multiple access channels, point-to-point -point channels, whatever they are, you put them together in whatever way you want. Those of you who have used SPICE or these various circuit design uh, programs can imagine putting together these components and connecting them in any configuration you want. We should be able to answer questions about the capacity of that network. Today, we don't have those tools, but I think as a community that it would be useful to work towards those tools. And I thought a little bit about one possible path towards designing such tools, and I'll tell you a little bit about such a path today. It's sort of how I got into this whole notion of reduction in the first game place. It's the first reductive game that I started to play. And here's how that argument works. So the argument starts with a, a network that has a lot of noisy components in it. Maybe it's all noisy components, but somewhere inside this network is a single point-to-point -point link. My goal is to model this network by something simpler for which I think I can build computational tools, in fact, for which there are already computational tools available. So I'd like to take this whole noisy network and replace it by a network of lossless links, a network coding network, because there's more hope, I think, of doing the direct analysis, capacity analysis on network coding networks using computational tools than there is on the noisy original network that we start with. So I'm going to try and play the following game. Imagine that you start with a very large network, and I'm going to try and simplify this network down piece by piece into a network coding network and see how I can relate these two networks to each other from a capacity perspective. So the first time we tried to play this game, we played it with a single noisy point-to-point -point link. So here is a very complicated network. It has m nodes in it. Imagine m is a billion, I mean a really large number, whatever it may be. But somewhere in this network, there's a wire. And that wire, let's assume, is memoryless, but it has noise on it. And I'd like to model that wire by a lossless link. In particular, I would like to relate that network to a network in which you replace that noisy channel by a truly lossless link. And the claim is that the capacity of the network will be unchanged if I remove this single component, this single channel, and replace it by a lossless link of exactly the same individual capacity. Now, that might seem like, well, it ought to be true. It seems kind of clear that, well, the best thing you can do across this network is to transmit at the capacity of that network. And if you do that, it'll look something like this. But you'll remember from lecture one that operating individual channels at their capacity is not optimal in a larger network. We demonstrated an example that worked that way. Um, but nonetheless, my claim, and it's proven in an old paper um, that relies on a reductive argument, is that the capacity of these two networks is actually unchanged. The error exponents are different, other things are different, but the capacities of these two networks happen to be identical. And the way that we prove that result is using a reductive argument to show that the capacity region of the original network is a subset or equal to the capacity region of what I call the network coding network. It's only got one lossless link so far, but eventually it will be all lossless <coughs> links. And likewise, that the capacity of the network coding network is a subset or equal to the capacity region of the original network. So you will have a dependence So this one doesn't have the noise of each This one is assumed to be independent of the rest of the network. Yes, it's assumed to have independent noise. Thank you, and that is important as we showed with the previous result. So how do we make this argument? The argument has two halves, and I'll only sketch them for you, but roughly they go like this. The capacity of the network coding network we're first going to show is a subset or equal to the capacity region of the original network. And the way that we do that is we imagine that we have some code that can operate on this network. It achieves some rate vector and some error probability. Hopefully this argument sounds familiar. We'd like to show that we can run that code on this network and get asymptotically the same error probability and rate. And it won't surprise you to learn that the way that we do that is by applying a channel code across this noisy channel to make it look like this lossless link. Now it turns out that the argument is significantly more complicated than that because you don't have n time steps to just sit around and apply your channel code and wait till it's done and you've decoded before you can use its output. So instead, we have to play the same interleaving game that we've been playing with the previous examples and channel code across multiple uses of the same code. 
So we're going to look at one uh, channel at one step in time and use that channel many, many times with many, many codes. Let's look at time step one of that code used many, many times on uh, separate messages. And we'll channel code across those and again cycle through those many uses of the same channel. I realize that's not enough, but hopefully it gives you the flavor of how we prove this result. So that gives you some sense as to this side of the argument. The other side of the argument goes much the same way, but actually this side is, is much harder. So in this case, we imagine that we have a code that operates on this noisy channel. It achieves some error probability and rate. And we want to show that we can design a code for the network with a lossless link that asymptotically achieves the same error probability and rate. This is a strange thing. You know, there are lots of things that you can do on a channel that you can't do on a lossless link. This lossless link, it just sends bits. This channel maybe had Gaussian values, maybe we were never decoding, maybe you know it was just transmitting along some noisy version of whatever it received. It's not obvious that you can actually do the same behavior, whatever behavior that was, in operating <coughs> the system. And it's made harder by the fact that we have no idea how to achieve the capacity of this network. So we can't rely on any nice properties of capacity achieving codes, because we don't know how to achieve capacity in this network. So we want to demonstrate that no matter what crazy strategy you might be using across this particular channel, we can mimic that same strategy across this lossless link. My co-author, Ralph Cotter, used to talk about the madman. You know, imagine that whoever designed the code, here's Ralph, imagine that whoever designed the code to work across this channel had designed, he was crazy. I mean, he came up with some crazy hairbane screen that we never would have used, which by the way, might be why we don't know how to get to capacity, because we haven't thought of that crazy system yet. But he was using some crazy code that doesn't look anything like the codes that we use in practice. We have to be able to mimic that one too. And so how are we going to do it? Well, it turns out that it's, it's a source coding problem that's hidden inside here. That is, you have some value x that's coming along, and you'd like to come up with a way to encode it so that it can be described at a rate of C. This is C, the capacity of that channel. That's how much rate we have available to us on this lossless link. Such that when you decode it, you get a reconstruction of the original X that looks not like a noisy version of X in the sense of source coding, but like a noisy version of X in the sense of this channel code. You wanted to mimic whatever conditional distribution this channel code was creating that's what you want your reconstruction to look like with respect to your source. And it won't surprise you to know that if you want to set up something that looks like it came from a distribution P of Y given X, the rate distortion theorem tells you it'll be about the mutual information between X and Y bits that'll be required to describe that information. And how much rate do we have available to us? Exactly the maximal value that that mutual information can take on for whatever the worst case distribution is. The hardest distribution is, it's the best case from a channel coding perspective, but the worst case from our perspective, the hardest to describe perspective, that's exactly how much rate we happen to have available to us. And this is how we do the argument. We can demonstrate that we can operate that code because we can mimic the performance of this channel, the behavior of this channel so accurately that no matter what the rest of the code was doing, our probability of error will still be going to zero not quite as quickly as before, but still be going to zero if it was going to zero with a sequence of codes on this network. It'll also be going to zero with a sequence of codes on this network, which demonstrates that any rate that's in the achievable rate region, the capacity region for the original network, is also in the achievable rate region for the network coding network. So at the core of the network capacity problem, I'll claim is the network coding capacity problem. And that is, if you have a network made up entirely of lossy channels, noisy channels, you could replace them all by lossless links of the same capacity, at least in the memoryless case, and find the capacity of that network coding instance instead. Which is good news, because I think that there, is, there are already tools, and there's much more hope for efficient computational tools for finding capacities of network coding networks. We can already use linear programs to find upper and lower bounds on capacities of network coding networks. They're very big linear programs. But nonetheless, we have some hope of building computational tools to tackle these tasks. Now, reduction can also be used to derive bounds. And that's important here because, of course, not everything is going to reduce to a lossless link. In fact, as soon as you go to broadcast and multiple access and um, other kinds of multi-terminal channels, we won't be able to show equivalence with lossless links. They simply aren't equivalent, at least as far as we can tell. But what we can do is play upper and lower bounding games. 
And the idea is something like this. Imagine that you have an arbitrary network. And somewhere inside of that network is a single noisy channel that we're currently working on replacing. Eventually, you can imagine having models for many, many channels. Just like we have models for capacitors and resistors and so on, you can imagine having a model for a Gaussian channel and a model for a multiple axis channel and a model for your fam favorite family of channels. And as people build up more and more models, you can have a bigger and bigger library from which you could play this computational um, uh, complex, uh, sorry, computational calculation game for network capacities. So imagine right now we're working on this channel C, whatever it may be, it may have many terminals, it may have very few, whatever it happens to be. What I'd like to do is come up with two models for this channel, one of which I'll call a lower bounding model, the other of which I'll call an upper bounding model. And the definition of lower and upper bounding models are the following. If you give me any network that contains the channel C, it should be true that when I rip out this particular channel C and replace it by C sub L, no matter what the rest of the network look like, I'm guaranteed that the capacity region of the new network, the network that you get when you put in C sub L instead of C, will be called N sub L. So the capacity region of that new network should be guaranteed to be a lower bound on the capacity region of the original network. And likewise, when you rip out that channel and replace it by an upper bounding model, no matter what the rest of the network looks like, no matter what demands you were trying to communicate across, we should be able to guarantee that the capacity region of the original network is a subset or equal to the capacity region of the upper bounding network. So we'll try and sandwich this network between two other networks. Both of those will be network coding networks. They'll be made entirely of lossless links, such that we can bound the capacity of the original network by finding the capacities of the lower bounding networks and upper bounding networks, which are both network coding networks made up of entirely lossless links. Now to date, we've come up with a few models for some example kinds of channels. Um, there's no claim that these models are optimal. They are just proof that such a thing exists. So for the broadcast channels, we have lower bounding models and upper bounding models. They look physically the same, but the capacities on the edges are different in general. So uh, the lower bounds and the upper bounds will not be identical to each other in general. We have, for multiple access channels, lower bounds and upper bounds, for relay channels, uh, for interference channels, and so on. We can come up with upper and lower bounds Excuse me, in the same way that you derive capacity results, you can derive uh, lower bounds or upper bounding models for a particular channel. And the more models that we come up with as a function over time, the more networks we'll be able to model by putting together these pieces. You'll notice that all of these networks are made entirely of lossless links. And therefore, if you model all the components in your, in your network, or if you study a network made only of components that you have previously modeled, you'll be able to turn your capacity problem on a noisy network into a capacity problem on a network coding network, and then start plugging it into some of these computational tools. I think at the heart of the matter is the realization that somewhere along the way, we're going to have to be able to use computational tools to prove true results about capacities of networks. There's no way to scale up to million and billion node networks without somehow getting computers involved. But we don't have to do that in a way that loses um, our provability. That is, we can do that in a way that proves true theorems. The result that comes out of your program should be a theorem about the network that you are trying to understand, an outer bound or an inner bound on the capacity of that particular network. And this is one tool by which you can start to do that. Just to give you an, a, a few examples to show that at least for very small cases we've been able to do that, this is a network called the Diamond Network, and it's been studied a few times in the literature. There's a whole thesis by Shine just studying this particular network, as well as a paper by Avestamir, Degavi, and Shea that uses this as an example. And, and what this network has is it has two channels in it. This is a broadcast channel uh, with Gaussian noise, and this is a multiple axis channel also with Gaussian noise. And if you go ahead and plug in the upper and lower bounding models for different parameters, I think what I changed here was the parameter O. Uh, on the horizontal axis, I'm cho changing rho, which is the correlation in these two noises. I'm sorry, no, these two noises. And I'm also changing, to play the game multiple times, I'm changing this parameter A in these two channel definitions just to get multiple instances of the same problem. And for each of these instances, I plotted both the lower bounds that we get out and the upper bounds that we get out, out of um, by applying our upper and lower bounding models and then finding the capacity of the network coding networks. And what you'll see is that our upper
or bounding models for any particular instance are very close to each other. It turns out that they're at most a half bit per symbol apart from each other. We can do this for any row, and it becomes a five minute exercise to come up with an upper and lower bound on the capacity of this network. Um, that compare that, for example, to an entire PhD thesis to come up with uh, bounds which work, I think, in this thesis, they work only in the asymptotic case and rho equals zero. They're very pretty results <laughs> that show you how to do code design on this problem, but they take several years to derive. Now we can come up with upper and lower bounds very quickly for this network and many other networks that we could have constructed out of the same components. Here's another example. In this example, I don't have anyone to compare to. You know, People haven't solved many of these problems because if you put noise into the problem, I'm not sure I know how to solve it either. But if you replace these noisy components by their lossless models, we can come up with lower bounds and upper bounds. And the only thing I could compare to was the cut set bounds on this network, which were a square region. So we cut that uh, gap about in half. Very simply, it becomes, again, a five-minute exercise once these models exist to just plug them in and calculate this as a simple network for which network coding capacity isn't hard to calculate. So we get upper and lower bounds um, very easily for some of these examples. All right, so that brings me, hopefully, up slightly late to some very quick conclusions. Um, I, I spent the last two lectures talking to you about this idea of reduction. And I think reduction, it's not a new tool, but I think it's a very useful tool that should be used more than it is in information theory. I encourage you to, to consider applying it. It allows us to find direct solutions to some long-standing open questions, such as the delay question we talked about in the first lecture. It makes possible a new type of unifying theory. I'm not sure that I know how to get at these kinds of general results without these kinds of reductive arguments. It highlights some canonical networks and canonical problems whose solutions would give you solutions to much more uh, broad classes of problems. And it can be applied to derive both solutions, as we've discussed for the majority of these two lectures, as well as bounds, such as uh, in the last example. So I will go ahead and stop there. But I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you.